Hi, this video is the second one in a series that explores creativity. That topic was originally suggested by a viewer who goes by the name of Scott Sheffield. So once again, many thanks to you, Scott, for that great suggestion. Anyhow, in the first video, we explored where creativity comes from. In that video, I suggested that creativity doesn't actually come from anywhere, but is inherent to the ongoing process of change, transformation, and impermanence that runs throughout all of our lives, as well as through the universe as a whole. But that realization sets up a seeming contradiction, which has to do with the fact that a lot of the time, life doesn't seem particularly creative, despite the fact that, in one way or another, we're always participating in the ongoing creation of unique and distinct moments in time, space, and experience. We then used Abraham Maslow's idea of the Jonah complex to make that seeming contradiction a little bit more comprehensible. Basically, the Jonah complex has to do with how a lot of the time we actively avoid fulfilling our deepest possibilities and potentials in life, which of course would include those having to do with creativity. And we ended by noting that a lot of what motivates our personal Jonah complexes has to do with fear, and that the work of enhancing creativity in our lives involves, among other things, facing our fears then learning to live past them, and finally, moving toward what Rollo May calls the courage to create. But that was the last video. In this video, I'd like to explore those fears in more detail, especially with respect to how they motivate and justify our fundamental ambivalence toward realizing our creative potential. However, I should probably also say that the kinds of fear I'll be describing are mostly a reflection of the struggles I've personally encountered along the road of creativity. And, as so often happens in life, your own experience may be very different from mine. Anyhow, as we go along, I'd also like to accumulate a list of seven suggestions for fostering and enhancing our creativity. And here's the usual roadmap of the actual contents of this video. As usual, you can find the same roadmap in the description section of this video, along with links to the timestamps. Okay, so let's continue exploring the idea that for the most part, we actively evade our creative birthright because of our fears. The obvious question at that point would be, fear of what? And probably the first answer would be, fear of the sense of responsibility that creative activity often entails. For most of us, responsibility is generally something with which we have a very ambivalent relationship. The reason is that most of us experience responsibility as a kind of weight, as something burdensome and onerous. But the thing about glimpsing our creative potential is that in one way or another we're responsible for whatever we do with it. If we try to deny or ignore it, well, then we're responsible for that. On the other hand, if we decide to do something with it, then we're responsible for that. No matter how you slice it, we're responsible. And while that can also be an occasion for experiencing great exhilaration, it can easily be daunting and <laughs> even downright nettlesome, which of course can easily coalesce into an abiding fear of responsibility, generally in life, but more specifically with regard to our creativity. As Stanley of Spider-Man fame once put it, with great power comes great responsibility. And so it is with the power of creativity. And so, if we feel a desire to foster enhanced creativity in our lives, my first recommendation would be to learn to assume real responsibility for our existence, for our time in this marvelous, terrifying world. However, a deeper and somewhat more primitive fear of our creative potential probably has to do with our interpersonal and social lives, especially with respect to the question of authenticity. And one of the more unsettling realities of this world is that for most of us, the easiest way to move through life is simply to conform to what everyone else is doing and or to just follow orders. And so, for a lot of us, the paradigm of conformity and obedience is a powerfully seductive thing. And on the other side of the divide, learning to be true to ourselves and consequently to navigate the seas of our lives according to the shining stars of our deeper possibilities and destiny 
is a pretty scary and daunting challenge. And of course, that's particularly evident in the domain of creativity, especially for those of us who've been told, <laughs> perhaps since childhood, that we aren't very creative, that we're not good enough at drawing or music or poetry or whatever, and that we shouldn't even bother trying. And after our creative souls have been wounded often enough, we've come somehow to associate our creative efforts with the sensation of shame and rejection, and then eventually come to see ourselves as fundamentally uncreative, as people for whom creative expression isn't really possible or feasible, at least not in any deep and satisfying way. But I'd say that in the final analysis, all of that's every bit as shallow, and unconvincing as any other propagandistic lesson in conformity and obedience. None of it really defines your soul, nor your creative possibilities in this life. It's just life's strange way of making you strong by first making you weak, which actually happens quite a lot when you think about it. And so at this point the question is, how can we begin to move past the all-too-seductive element of inauthenticity in our creative lives. Well, I'd say that at one level it involves learning to be brave in who and what we are, learning to resist all of the enticements that would keep us enslaved to values and ways of life that are not authentically our own. But of course, that's a pretty tall order and not necessarily an easy one. So. What can we do when we're not feeling strong enough to be that courageous, when we're so mired in a life of conformity and obedience that we can barely see a way out of it? Well, I think in that case it's important to wait and to allow ourselves to get sick, truly sick and fed up with living like slaves. Slaves to other people's perceptions and judgments of us. Slaves and helots genuflecting at the temple of someone else's hollow tin gods. It's important at some point to get definitively oversaturated and exhausted with that entire pattern of life, with all of the falseness and cloying obsequiousness of it, so much so that we can't even stand it for another minute, not even another second and we just have to give birth to something that's at once far beyond ourselves and at the same time deeply true to ourselves. Something perhaps only vaguely perceptible, shining like a star on the distant outer edge of everything we've known thus far. In that respect, the pull of inauthenticity resembles nothing so much as addiction. That's because, for most of us, conformity and obedience are basically a lot like drugs. Forces in our lives that keep us moving from day to day in a bleary, soporific haze, most especially along the spiritual dimension. And like addiction, moving past inauthenticity usually requires some sort of bottoming out experience. In other words, a truly hellish, agonizing realization of what it's really costing us. Basically, a bottoming out experience is an excruciating wake-up call, something that's strong enough to jolt us out of our complacency by showing us how we're squandering our deepest human birthright, our creative souls themselves, along with our chance to live our own lives for a moment, maybe two or three, quite apart from anyone else's agendas, at long last to live authentically, brilliantly, like a bolt of lightning flashing across the midnight sky. So, if you're wondering about how to foster creativity in your own life, my second recommendation would be to start living your own life as much as you can, rather than wallowing in some kind of counterfeit, inauthentic existence someone else would deem appropriate for you. Of course, that probably also means learning to tolerate a certain level of negative judgmentalism, shaming, and rejection from other people, all of which is probably inevitable in any sort of genuinely creative life. And by the way, if you're anxious about whether your friends and loved ones will still like you if you start doing more of that, well, 
I'd say that your real friends will because your real friends are the ones who actually see you and understand you, not only for who you are, but for who you can be. As for the rest, well, I suspect that the rest will fall away sooner or later, like dried leaves in the autumn wind. And yeah, that may hurt, at least for a little while, but when you think about it, if those, quote, friends, can't let you be who you really are, if they can't let you evolve and become the person you're truly capable of being, well, you might just ask yourself whether they were ever your friends at all. A little something to think about somewhere along the road of creative life. Anyhow, the third and related region of fear I'd like to explore has to do with failure and with taking risks more generally. The truth is that most great acts of creativity require wading through vast swamps of bad ideas, misbegotten desires, and unrealistic fantasies. That's because a very, very few of us are like Mozart in the movie Amadeus, who supposedly wrote great music as if he were just blithely taking dictation from God. Instead, most of us are much more like Thomas Edison, who reportedly had to fail around a thousand times before he finally found a combination of filaments and gases that could make a functional light bulb work, all the while not knowing if it was even possible in the first place. He just kept failing and failing until he finally succeeded. But to move through life with that kind of tenacity means confronting our fear of failure which is to say, the sense of danger we feel when we think that our creative efforts will end in some sort of miserable catastrophe, and that that catastrophe will somehow become a shameful marker of who and what we are as human beings, a kind of indelible black mark on our souls themselves. In my own life, I've found that one useful way of dealing with those sorts of nightmarish fantasies is to realize that the universe won't actually implode if I fail at something or if I do something dumb. That's because the universe is actually <laughs> divinely indifferent to our successes and failures. Basically, life doesn't give a crap whether we succeed or fail or whether we die later today even. <laughs> there, now do you feel better? Well, actually, you might. Because what that means is that there's no actual necessity for most of our fears and fantasies about the prospect of failure. And anyhow, when you think about it, a brave failure is often far more beautiful and far more worthwhile than a cheap, craven success. So all things considered, my third suggestion for fostering creativity in our lives would be find a way of making friends with failure and with the sensation of danger. However, perhaps a more fundamental kind of fear has to do with chaos itself and with our desire to control it. Basically, our fear of losing control over life's overwhelming tidal forces. And the thing about the creative process is that a lot of the time it's pretty messy, in part because it involves extending ourselves beyond the rules that normally keep the world orderly and predictable. As the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once famously said, one must still have chaos within oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. And I strongly suspect that he was right about that. So, if our desire in life is to see everything neatly ordered and regulated and controlled, well, that probably doesn't leave too much room for real creativity. The reason is that creativity resides in the confluence of both chaos and order, both serendipity and predictability. And so my fourth recommendation would be learn to swim comfortably in the seas of both chaos and order, those disquieting creative latitudes where everything dissolves and coalesces. The fifth area of fear is something related to chaos, but which is probably a little more personal. It involves recognizing that as creators, <laughs> we are also destroyers. 
That's because every act of creation also involves destroying something in one way or another. For instance, you carve the pieta out of solid marble. Well, congratulations. But at the same time, you've ruined a perfectly good piece of natural stone. You paint the Mona Lisa. Well, you've destroyed a nice pristine canvas in the jars of paint you used. Even poets and musicians aren't immune from that. If you write a poem on paper, well, you're destroying some nice clean paper as well as the trees it took to produce it. If you're using a computer, you're consuming the natural resources it takes to power it. And if you're tempted to weasel out of it by relying on solar energy, well, the reality is that the source of that energy, the sun, is slowly burning itself out via the processes of nuclear fusion, and your computer is dependent upon the trajectory that will lead to the sun's ultimate destruction. And my god, if you're ever rash enough to read your poem to another person, well, suddenly you're consuming a few minutes of someone's life. A few minutes that will be gone forever. <laughs> Sorry. And if that's not enough, when you think about it, there's probably no more destructive force in this world than creative ideas. For instance, Einstein's creativity destroyed our ardent love affair with the monolithic inviolability of Newton's equations. Galileo's creativity ultimately helped destroy our equally ardent investment in seeing the Earth and ourselves as the center of everything. You're probably getting the picture. So the upshot is that when you think about it, creation and destruction are always integrally linked to each other, so much so that every creative act is also an act of destruction. And as a consequence, if we're going to pursue the creative life, well, in one way or another, we need to make peace with that reality. We need to come to grips with the fact that as creators, we are also bringers of ruin and annihilation, no matter how much we want to think otherwise. And really, there's nothing inherently wrong or immoral about that. It's just how creativity works. So my fifth recommendation would be to make peace with being a destroyer and to create something worthwhile anyhow. And that reciprocal dynamic between creation and destruction becomes even more pointed and scary when we realize that it's also how life itself works, especially insofar as all of our lives are always sustained and perpetuated by the death of something else, be it plants or animals or both. For instance, when you think about it, our entire digestive systems are pretty much always full of the decomposing, dismembered bodies of dead animals and plants. And since at some level life itself is an unavoidably creative process, our creativity is also secretly sustained by death. But if it's difficult to accept the fact that as creators we are also destroyers, it's probably even harder to accept the fact that we're also killers and bringers of death with every breath we take. Accepting that disquieting reality requires cultivating a much more intimate relationship with death, and hence with life, than most of us are comfortable with. It requires not only recognizing that all of our creative efforts are resting on a hidden foundation of death and annihilation, but also confronting the fact that we ourselves are constantly inching toward death day by day. And that's especially true in our relation to creativity, which so often involves allowing what is cheap and trivial in ourselves to die off. Basically, to die as a small being, moment by moment. And so my sixth recommendation would be, allow yourself to become intimate with mortality with the ongoing fading and dissolution of things, and learn to own the fact that as we move through this world, we're always giving birth and we're always dying at the same time as one moment in our lives gives way to the next. And in a way, that brings us to the last reason, or at least the next reason, why creativity requires courage. It's the fact that when we're fully immersed in the creative moment, when we're completely consumed by its demands and its overwhelming power, well, experiencing all of that can easily change us.
both in the moment itself as well as over the course of many years of creative involvement. It can easily carry us beyond the outer perimeter of everything that feels safe and familiar and leave us altered and transfigured. And so it's easy to find that the poem we thought we were writing has somehow written us and has somehow inscribed itself forever in the living book of our breath and sinews. And the music we thought we were playing has suddenly become, well, the song of our very souls. <laughs> Surprise! But the thing is that experiencing all of that requires a fair amount of courage. The reason is that most of us spend our lives clinging pretty tightly to who and what we think we have to be, to what we've been told to think and how we've been told to feel. But I hate to tell you, the muses that preside over our creative activities don't give a damn about any of that. What they care about is whether we can reach past everything that is cheap and small within ourselves and catch the edge of the outermost horizon. They care about whether we can learn to dance and play in the furthest expanses of our imagination and then make something beautiful and brilliant out of it. They don't care about how well we obey or conform or whether we look cool or whether what we're doing is appropriate according to someone's chintzy measure. What they care about is whether we can approach the creative moment as we might approach something sacred, with a heart pure and full of passion, whether we can stand shivering on the brink of creativity's high precipice and then fall into that endless expanse unreservedly and completely, leaving nothing behind not even an expectation of survival. And so my seventh and final recommendation would be to open yourself to change, to being transported and then transfigured by creativity's powerful storm, its gales sounding like a maddening symphony in your ears. And that's why the creative life demands courage and why our creative endeavors call for the best of what we are. So, let's take a moment or two to summarize. Basically, a creativity requires facing our fears with courage and then moving forward in spite of them. And in my experience, that involves, one, assuming responsibility for our existence. Two, letting go of the paradigm of conformity and obedience and replacing it with authenticity and a desire to live our own lives. Three, making friends with failure and the sensation of danger and learning to see them as integral to the larger creative process. Four, learning to dwell comfortably in the confluence of both order and chaos. Five, making peace with being a destroyer, especially by realizing that every act of creation is also an act of destruction. Six, developing an intimate and realistic relationship with death, and hence an intimate and realistic relationship with the reality of life itself. And the seven, oops, opening ourselves to the dynamisms of change and transformation, which are, after all, inevitable in this world. And because of all of that, living the creative life can seem like a pretty daunting challenge and one that we have every reason to avoid. And that's probably actually very true. But when you think about it, what's the alternative? To live a life ruled by conformity and obedience, a craven existence of unremitting enslavement to everything that's small and shallow within ourselves and in the world? Is that really a preferable alternative to paying the price that the creative life demands? And if it all seems too quixotic, and too impossible, well, <laughs> so what? As Goethe once noted, those of us who yearn for the impossible are perhaps especially worthy of love and veneration. And if perhaps you're thinking that none of this really pertains to you because for some reason the muses have left you bereft of any creative hope whatsoever, I'd like to tell you that 
Well, I'd like to tell you that I think you're wrong about that. And in all probability, it's just a lie you've been told at some point in your life, probably at an age when it was really easy to believe it. But I really don't think that's actually who or what you are. Personally, I think that we all have access to creativity in one way or another. It's just a matter of convincing ourselves of it. Convincing ourselves that there's a creative power that lies somewhere in our souls, even if it's deeply buried, and then persuading ourselves that we can reach it. Anyhow, <laughs> that's the gospel according to Eric for today. Thanks as always for listening, and as always, take care of your soul, creatively and otherwise.